Paulson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. How's it going, man? Oh, it's great. It's good to be with you today. Um, let's just start off with a little bit kind of about your story, kind of leading up to founding Via Heart and some of the companies that you've been involved with. Sure. So um, after I graduated from college, um, it was like 2009 and uh, it was like kind of the, the trough of the financial crisis. And I got I got a minimum wage job working at like a consulting firm uh, in the Northeast. And I got fired from that job um, because it was a little bit like unruly. And I kind of eventually figured out that if I wanted to like succeed in the world, I probably need to do something a little bit unconventional, probably maybe be an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur, so maybe I was like copying him in some way. And so um, I got another job after I got fired and I was working in a hedge fund. And one day I just I just quit and I had an idea for a product that needed to be made in China. And I ended up asking the richest person I knew. I was like, hey, man, how do I do this? I don't know anything about this. I don't speak Chinese. I'm, I've never done manufacturing in my life. And he kind of just sat me down and he said, Molson, uh, the Chinese, they're like face to face. So you got to go to China. And uh, the story is a little bit longer than that. But one way or another, I, I, I made my way to China and uh, the first product failed, but the second product didn't. And 11 years later, here we are. Uh, you know, we've got like a pretty sizable educational e-commerce toy company. So that's how, what, uh, what was the first here. product? Uh, it was something called Kikbo, K-I-K-B-O. And people who've been to China, um, they've probably seen this before in the parks. There was this, there's this like giant badminton shuttlecock looking thing that people kick kind of like hacky sack. And the idea was that mm -hmm. like this was super popular over in China. Why couldn't it be popular in America? And so the idea was that we were going to commercialize this Chinese product, which is actually called Jianzi, um, but we called it Kickbo. And so I, after I launched the product, I would go like store to store, soccer shops, toy stores, because back in 2010, man, we, we didn't have e-commerce. We didn't really have Amazon like we do today. So I would just try to sell the product through stores. Um, but uh, didn't really make any money, but just like kind of kept at it. Second product ended up making money and that's what saved the business. All right. So you talk to this rich guy and he tells you to go uh, over to China and learn and let's spend some time on this. So like, did you set up an itinerary? Did you just show up and just kind of, you know, meander around? Like what, what did you accomplish in that trip and how long were you over there and kind of giving you mm -hmm. comfort to start working with the Chinese? Okay, so I had, so this is like, this is 2010. I had a factory in mind that I wanted to buy from. And uh, I had gotten an air shipment of our first product already at that point, And I had sold through it. But when you ship things by air, you don't make any money because the shipping costs are so high. Yeah. So imagine the cost of goods is like $2.10. And I'm selling them to stores uh, for $2.50. And I'm like hand delivering them. And stuff like that. So totally uneconomical. So yeah, speak with the rich guy. And he says things like, hey, if you want to make this business work, you have to be ordering by the container load. And if, if you've ever gotten like advice from like an old wise person, like you listen to the advice, but sometimes you don't really understand it until later. Yeah. And so that sounds like stupid. Like, I, So basically what he was saying is that if you want to make any money in this business, you have to scale it up. Yep. You have to like kind of like do things via sea shipping and stuff like that if you want to make money. So I had a factory. And at the time, it turns out that the factory wasn't in like, it wasn't on the beaten path. It wasn't in Beijing. It wasn't in Shenzhen. It wasn't in Shanghai. It, it was actually in the city called Dandong, which is on the border with North Korea. And I'm not really sure if he knew where he was like sending me by advising me to go to China, but that's where he was sending me. So I told my mom, I was like, hey, I'm going to China. And she's like, they're going to cut your organs out. Um, <laughs> I don't care how rich that guy is. <laughs> Fuck him. He's killing my son. But um, <laughs> I went there anyway. And so I told the factory that I was going to come. And there was no direct flights from New York. Uh, I'm from Connecticut to Dandong. You, you had to fly into Beijing. And so there was a snowstorm. I spent 16 hours in the airport in New York. Finally, we got on a flight to Beijing. I got on a flight to Beijing. And then I, I, you know, I get it out of the Beijing airport and I book a cab. And the cab, uh, it says taxi on top. 
like T-A-X-I. And I didn't realize that I booked like a, a private, I hailed a private cab, not like an authentic cab. So this guy brings me, I, I asked for a hotel. I hadn't booked a hotel in advance. So he just brings me to like the middle of the construction site at like 3 a.m. And it's like, hey, give me $30, which is like way more than a cab would cost in Beijing at that time. And I was like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. It's the middle of the night. I hate that I'm in this position, but I'm going to pay this guy 30 bucks. And then I'm just in the middle of the fucking construction site. And I just wheeled my suitcase <laughs> around until I found a real cab. And then by that time I got to, uh, and he brought me to a real hotel, but then it was like 4 a.m. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to save money. It's 4 a.m. What do I need to pay for a hotel for? So I just slept in their lobby, their lobby until 6 a.m. At 6 a.m. I made my way over the Beijing train station. And then I found some Chinese guy who, in a weird way, I'm like thankful for. And he, he bought my, my train tickets to not Dandong, but to Pyongyang. So if you want to go to Dandong, you have to book a train to Pyongyang. The train goes all the way to North Korea. And the the second the, the last stop in China is Dandong. He booked my tickets. And so I just I I just waited for another like 10 hours. I hadn't slept much, just waiting to hear Pyongyang. And then Pyongyang came and then I got on a sleeper train that had six beds per car per per little compartment in a car. And it was me and five Chinese people who had never really seen like a white person at times. And then other Chinese people would come into my compartment and they'd try to talk to me, see what was going on. And then um, finally I got to Dandong like 13 hours later, it was a slow train and it was like snowy. And the, my first memory of Dandong was seeing a giant statue of like Mao in their train station, like holding up his hand. And then, and then like behind him, like a billboard of like Nicholas Cage with like a Rolex or something. And then my <laughs> factory, boss person met me there and I was in Dandong and that, that, that's how so that began. What, what did you do? What did you do at the factory? Like what, what did you need to accomplish there to make it a successful trip and like sure. answer it in a way that like a listener could get success going over to China as well? Well, if this was like 11 years ago, so things were different and especially things were different, yeah. like off the beaten path. So for a listener, it's really good to be on the factory floor because you can see how things are made. In theory, you're going to get a better quality product if you meet people. Chinese culture is about face-to-face -face relationships. It's not as much about contracts and design specifications and stuff like that. But the, the really the essence of like going to China is seeing your products get made. That's hugely important. Yep. I just watched like a video of Elon Musk yesterday talking about how people think that the most important thing about Tesla or SpaceX is the designs of the cars or the designs of the rocket spaces of the manufacturing is way more important in our experience. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. So um, the reason why I went to China, it was actually because we had a design and progress just wasn't being made. Um, things weren't moving far along. And at that time, uh, it was really hard to get like non-toxic uh, materials and ingredients for the products that you wanted to make. And so it was like the factory was making these, these like badminton shuttlecock things that you kick that we were calling kick bows, but they were made of like newspaper and rusty metal coins. And if they had PVC and the plastic parts were made from PVC but the PVC had plasticizers in it, which weren't legal for American toys. So we had to switch all those, basically those chemical ingredients. And that just wasn't happening. And yep. that, that's a problem. You've got to make progress. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go there, meet the guy face to face, figure this out. I mean, I was so naive and like stupid. And, but that, that's why I went to China. Okay, so the first uh, product fails. The second one was successful. What was is the second one kind of what you launched via heart off the backs of? Yeah. So, um, so we launched Kickbo, and I mean it wasn't successful in the sense that it didn't make money, but I was able to sell it, which is like hugely important. So I was like, our first batch of product ended up being like fifty percent defective. And I went back to America. I got my container of defective product. 
And I actually went to a church in a nearby town that had like illegal immigrants. I would go there at 6 a.m. I'd bring the illegal immigrants back to my house and we'd repackage the product um, just to, to fix the defects and stuff like that. But so that product didn't really work, but I eventually managed to sell it all by changing the packaging and all that stuff. All right. So second product. At one point before I left China, the factory boss's trading company was like, hey, I think you should sell this other product. Um, it's doing really well in the schools or something. And I was like, no, I'm committed to kickbell. I didn't keep an open mind. Um, yeah. And then, um, but so we, we sold through this defective product and I was like, man, this isn't working, but I've learned a lot. And most importantly, I didn't want to like admit that I had failed. So I was like, okay, can I just double down? And so I doubled down on like three new products because at that point, after like one or two years, I did have some manufacturing experience and I knew kind of like how to sell stuff, not because I was good at sales, but because I was like really persistent. Yeah. Um, and so we launched a product called Goodminton, the world's easiest racket game. And um, it's it's hard to explain, but it's just it's like a version of badminton. So we call it Goodminton. That's just way easier than badminton. And it's like kind of beautiful to watch it play. And to this day, we continue to sell it. It's one of our best sellers. I've, it's got a beautiful name, and I really like the product. So, at that point, was that on? Was that was Via Heart launched at that point, or were these just kind of one-off products? And you were just Molson, the guy selling toys from China and America, or sporting products? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, you're the way you describe it is is more accurate. So, Via Heart is an unfortunate name. It was like a total afterthought. The idea is that the company was going to be called Kickbo, K-I-K-B-O. And Viaheart was just like something that I scribbled on a form when I formed the LLC. But then once we started launching other products, you know, you, you're selling to toy stores and stuff like that. You have to, they have to pay someone. And it didn't really make sense for them to like pay Kickbo for Goodminton when Kickbo was a product. And, so like uh, Viaheart was just, it was a distributor of like new interesting products to, to retail until uh, 2014, basically. All right. Before we get into kind of what I've known you for, which is e-commerce and taking what you were doing and, and putting it online, maybe just like one more question on China that maybe brings it to today. What are like the the good parts about working with China and then what are the things that you still don't like about working with China? China, that's a really good question. So China taught me so much. I learned so many hard lessons over there. You have no idea. Um, so if you're comparing like Chinese business culture to American business culture, Chinese make decisions much faster than Americans. They use meetings less often. As part of the making decisions faster, they're faster to kind of like be like, oh, that was wrong. That was stupid. Let's just go back and let's fix it. So it's all about speed yep. over there. Um, failure is it's it's less punished socially, I think, than it is in America. So if you open a noodle shop in China, it doesn't go well. It's like, OK, whatever. Next time, like I'll be lucky next time or something like that. In America, I feel like people yep. like look down on you a little bit more than they do in China. Yep. Um, you know, in America, we're very focused on contracts. In China, we're much more focused, people are much more focused on relationships and like understanding. Things are much more fluid in China. Things in America are more rigid, more transactional. I mean, yep. of course, there are things that we do much better than they do. Um, there's very weak intellectual property enforcement. People in China like screw you nonstop. If there's some an op some opportunity for them to like make a little bit more money, sometimes it feels like they'll just go for it, even though if it, even though it's like myopic. Um, once have you ever been to China? No. Oh, dude, you gotta go. I've been it's, to Thailand, but that's not China. I've never been to Thailand, so I don't know what that's like. But when you go to there are a lot of Chinese people in Thailand. But um, when you go to China, there's this like entrepreneurial, economic, business energy that like me even thinking about right now, just like, oh, it like pumps me up. I fucking love it. Like, yeah, you just it's like it's all about like, let's do deals. Let's make things happen and stuff like that. And there's not as much of that in America uh, as there is in China. 
yeah. feel like there's there's some of that in Texas, which I dig, but oh China man, like oh, it's like let's make money, let's get together, let's like let's do stuff. There's there's some like really good business optimism. So it's a double edged sword. The good things about China, the good things about America, bad things about both places. I try to like put together the best things from both places when I do business. Yep. Well, if you related it to like, if you've ever watched a show on like going to jail, if you're new to jail, you kind of have to earn respect and, and, you know, show people that you're strong. If in China, as you get bigger and do more business, do, do people become more trustworthy? Like, do you gain more leverage based on your size and tenure in relationships? Or are you always kind of, you know, one step away from getting screwed? You're always one step away from getting screwed. Yeah. You certainly get better customer service. You get better product quality. You get better pricing if you are ordering in large quantities. And if you order consistently in large quantities over a long period of time, for sure that's true. But I'd, I'd be lying to you if I... I just, every, it's just like almost every vendor over there has pulled some some BS, whether it's counterfeiting our products or launching something that's really similar on Amazon or, you know, giving our designs to or to a competitor. It's just, they just, it just happens over and over and over again. So you just kind of need to understand that that's going to happen and you just have to accept it. And it is what it is. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because <laughs> even with that downside to buying things in China and to some extent it happens outside of China in Asia. I'm not saying like, you know, American suppliers aren't perfect. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, American suppliers are so much more expensive and, and so much slower than the Chinese, even though they're closer that you, you got to work with China in this in the consumer products industry. And that's okay. Just yep. that's what it is. All right. So you've got this business, you start getting some products that are working, you're doing it all brick and mortar kind of door to door sales. And, uh, this internet thing is really starting to take off and e-commerce. So kind of paint the picture for when you, the light bulb went off that maybe I would be better suited starting to sell online and not brick and mortar. Yeah, sure. So I was in my apartment in Dandong in 2014. And I was looking at an ab roller on Amazon that had like a hundred reviews. And it was like, I don't remember, it was like 10 bucks or something like that. And I was looking at it and I was like, okay, this thing has a hundred reviews. So it's got to, it like, let's assume that one out of a hundred people review. So it sold 10,000 units or something like that, a hundred times a hundred, 10,000. And it's selling for 10 bucks. And like, I know that this product costs less than a dollar to make. Like, holy shit, like, can I just cut out the retailer and just like buy products directly from the Chinese and sell them directly to American consumers on Amazon? Because I knew that the volume was there. So I had this eureka moment and then I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to be so rich or something like that. These were the things I was thinking. <laughs> um, and uh, I ended up taking that idea to Y Combinator later. But um, so that was the thought. And then around that time, our biggest customer, so we managed to build up the retail business. We're not really focused on e-commerce at that time. We were doing a lot of private label deals with a, a chain of like 30 or so toy stores. And um, we were doing private label deals. So that Goodmanton product I told you about was like co-branded with them. So if, if, imagine if it were like Toys R Us, it would be like Toys R Us Goodmanton on the paddle. Yep. And what was cool about this is that meant that they were excited about it because it had their brand on it and they would buy in very large quantities. And so we ended up making some money doing that, selling to retail. But on the last private label deal we did with them, there were like five payments or something like that. And the last payment was like $8,000. And they were like, hey, we're not going to pay you because the quantity the quality wasn't where we thought it should be. It wasn't for Goodman's and it was a different product. And I disagreed and I was like... Um, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast, but I was like, fuck you guys. This is fucking ridiculous. Like, I don't like this is this is fucking nonsense. I don't need this. And I was like, let's just pivot to e-commerce. And so we just stopped going to trade shows. And it like I was a lot better at e-commerce anyway, because I, I'm I'm like more data oriented, I'm like more nerdy. 
Yeah. And so at that time, I had like a ton of social anxiety in like dealing with buyers and like making sales and stuff like that. I have less now, still have it. I'm not like a good people person, I don't think. And so I was like, let's pivot to e-commerce. Fuck these buyers. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about anyway. And so we just started sending all our products into Amazon. And then that Christmas, I was just like, holy shit. Like, we are crushing it. Like, it didn't matter. I, we started selling anything. Like, springs, um, glassware, yoga mats, yoga blocks, towels. Just literally, these are the things we were buying in China. We were just selling them on Amazon because it was profitable and it was easy. Yeah. So that's how we ended up pivoting the e-commerce. Taking one step back on our pre-call, you were talking about how I think you got on the Amazon of China or whatever and just started going through all their products. Like, how did you know to sell mm -hmm. towels and glassware and all this stuff? Like, how did you make that a thing? So for towels and glassware, in 2014, 2015, you could literally sell anything you wanted on Amazon and it was profitable. You didn't really need to do data analysis. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like if you were buying in China and you didn't do an absolutely abominable job, if you sent it in Amazon, you were making money. What you're talking about is when you're selling into retail, it's like a different. So Amazon, you could just sell commodities in 2014, 2015, just literally a towel. It didn't have to have a brand or anything. You could sell towels. Yeah. But to sell into retail, which was a developed market, I can't like call up Walmart and be like, Hey, I'm this 26 year old kid and I'm going to sell you towels. Like they're like, no, we're going to buy from branded manufacturers of towels and factories, of towels and people who have like an established, um, some credibility in this industry, not you. So if we wanted to sell into retail, we had to bring innovative products, um, to the table. Otherwise there was no incentive for them to take a risk on like a young company with the young founder, et cetera. So I figured out at one point, I was like, hmm, maybe instead of like coming up with all of these innovative products, which we did too, innovation making new products is like super hard. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can just find stuff that's like already really popular in China, Japan, or Korea. And we'll just bring it to America and like rebrand it. So then what I did is I just went on to Taobao, which is like China's Amazon. And I went through like tens of thousands of products. I've just looked at the top sellers in every category, toys, games, bikes, sporting goods, all that stuff. And I would just, anytime I saw a product that was selling really well in China, that was that I had never seen before, I just like put it into a bucket. I was like, okay, we're going to launch this in America. And so that's what we did. And, and by and large, that was actually like a pretty effective strategy. And uh, that's actually how Brain Flakes was, was born. I was just like, like the top like three, three through five best selling toys in China were interlocking plastic discs. And I was like, okay, like I had seen like shitty bigger versions of interlocking plastic discs when I was a kid, but like small circular ones were new. And I was, Brain Flakes is the product that we sell. And I was like, okay, let's, Let's try this. And so I came up with the name, came up with some branding, changed up with the packaging, and we just rolled with with an off-the-shelf disc that we found in China, and we started selling it on Amazon um, and trying to sell it to retailers. We like brought it to a trade show. No one bought a trade show. But on Amazon, you just put this new interlocking plastic disc product, and we were sold out so fast. It was like the demand was just there. Fast forward five or six years, Brain Flakes, like we have our own molds. We've got a patent pending. It's legit. We put a ton of investment into it. But to start, it was just looking for hot selling products on Taobao, Amazon, China's Amazon that weren't selling in America and just being like, let's rebrand it and bring it to America. I, I know we're talking about 2014 and 2015 and now we're in 2021. So I hope these questions are relevant. If they're not, just break them up based on time zones. But when you say like, yeah, we just go find this product and then we launch it. Walk me through like what launching it means. Like you find it and then maybe you buy a few and, and see them in person. Then you, you have to come up with your own packaging. Like what does it take to truly launch a product on Amazon to where you could kind of do it at scale? Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that like it's 2021. Okay. Let's say we go to... Uh, you go to Korea and you see something that you've never seen before and it's selling really well. Yeah, you're, you're right. First, 
you buy a sample. And then if you want to, you have to optimize for speed in entrepreneurship. You don't want to run out of money. You don't want to burn money, but speed is like super important. So if possible, you want to find the factory that makes that product, not a factory that makes similar stuff, but you want to find the factory that makes that product. And you kind of just need to work through the supply chain to do that. So in China, if we were buying a product, I'd be like, okay, where's this product shipping from? And then I'd contact the distributor and I just try to get all the way until the factory, cut out as many middlemen as possible. And then just initiate a conversation with them and be like, hey, we want to buy this many units. And can you do that? Give me a price. And in China, you never know who's making what <laughs> and who is who. It's it's kind of a black box in a lot of ways. But yeah, you say yeah, how much you know how much for this product, and then you send some specifications. You buy the products. You do an inspection, which is super important. Now, uh, like in real estate, you got to do an inspection before you yeah. you close on the property. You do an inspection before you close, so to speak, on the on the product you're buying to make sure that you don't get defective products like I did mm. on my first order. So you don't have to hire illegal immigrants to fix the problem later. Yeah. Um, and then you ship it to America using a freight forwarder. And when you're starting out, you ship it to your garage and you hold it there and you figure out a way to make sales. That's kind of how that works. What do you have to do around packaging? Do you have to just hire some consultant that creates a nice package for you to put all this stuff in? Because you had kind of talked about, you know, you would repackage stuff so that it would work for American consumers. So um, you you don't, if you're starting out, don't hire a consultant. That's a terrible yeah. idea. You're going to like waste a lot of money. Um, you, ideally, you want to design your own packaging in some way. Every product needs to have different packaging. In a store, the packaging should be one way. For e-commerce, it can be a different way. Because in e-commerce, uh, the website is kind of your packaging. Right. Um, for us, what ended up happening is that we designed really, I designed really bad packaging, which I hand drew. And so the product would, I could sell it to the stores, but it wouldn't sell out of the stores after I sold it to the stores. Right. And so I, I'm very indebted, actually, to this guy, um, this buyer. He was like, hey, I think your product is cool, but your packaging sucks. Like, can you fix it? And so when we were when I when we were repackaging the, that defective product in America using illegal immigrants. Um by the way, like after a few days, the the guys I hired didn't even want to do the work because it was like hard and they made more money landscaping. So I had to find like the really old guys who couldn't do landscaping to do it, which was just really hard. Yep. Um but so I bought a bunch of packaging in America. So the packaging was all, so we bought plastic tubes from an American manufacturer and stuff like that. And um, that's how we repackaged it. And so I, I learned a lot bringing products to Starbucks and then asking people what they thought they were. When you're selling a new product, yep. like it's important that people understand it as soon as they see that product. So you bring... I'd just walk up to people in Starbucks and be like, hey, what is this? And people had no idea. And people aren't going to buy something that they don't understand. And so that's one of the ways I learned yep. a lot about how to package products. So you were getting shipped early days into your garage and then a sale would happen like a $20, you know, Brain Flakes jug or bin. And you're mm -hmm. literally just walking out to the garage, putting it in a box and letting UPS know they need to come by and pick up the box. Not even that sophisticated. I, every day we'd collect the orders and then I would drive them to the post office to, to save on that pickup fee. Yeah. What, uh, Drop them off. Did, did, did Amazon put requirements on you that you had to have the package being shipped within a certain amount of time of the, uh, stuff being bought? Uh, yeah. And, they absolutely did and to this day it's still like that but also uh we were able to after a little while we were able to use fda yeah. which was the fulfillment by amazon and so what we could do is we could store our products in amazon which was actually like a great help to us because it freed up my time and i no longer needed to drive to the post office five days a week um and so the goods were stored in amazon's warehouses so that when the customer ordered amazon did the shipping to, to the customers 
All right. So Brain Flakes is your your biggest item. Uh, you sold uh, 120,000 jars of it last year. I was one of those jars. For anybody listening, they're great for kids. Um, how do you grow that going forward? Like, it, is the goal to grow it to a million jars or like, how do you think about that product? Is it to really sell more or continue selling what you're selling? Like, how does that grow? Yeah, that's a good question. The honest answer is I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. So um, we, one of the, there are a lot of different ways to grow the product. One of the ways to grow the product is to get it into schools. And so you could market the product to schools and get your product in catalogs. And we do that. And another way to grow uh, a consumer product is to get it into retail. Uh, these days, like you got to, if you want to do good retail volume, you, you probably need to be in a grocery store or something like that. Uh, Brain Flakes is at a chain of teacher educational stores called Lakeshore Learning, which is cool. And that helps um, tremendously. Other ways to grow it is internationally. So our goal for Brain Flakes, um, believe it or not, is to be the second bill of the biggest building toy brand in not just the United States, but the entire world, with the first one being Lego. I don't think we can be number one. Um, And so we've set up distributors in Japan, Canada, Mexico, uh, the United Kingdom, Singapore, and Australia. And then what we want to do is just kind of be a little bit different. So with, with Lego, they are the one of the ways they make all their money is by having you constantly buy new sets of Lego. And so what we're trying to do is, is make that digital. So when you get your set of brain flakes, interlocking plastic discs, you just like buy them in bulk, like you would like a thousand random uh, Lego blocks. And what we're hoping to do is just sell you digital instructions that you can then buy from our website and then use that to build a castle, a house, a car. So you know, we're just going to try everything and double down on what works, which is like, you know, standard entrepreneurship one-on-one. You don't really know what's going to happen. So just try a little bit of everything at small stakes and then whatever's working, you double down on it. Okay. So you, you, you have 250 to 300 other products and you're an eight person Mm -hmm. team, which we'll get into the team in a little bit, but how do you like at 250 to 300 is, is that you that's constantly adding more uh, to it? And then is it on autopilot that as soon as you sell through a SKU or something, it just automatically rebuys and, and ships another um, container to you? Like, how do you manage 300 SKUs with eight, an eight person team? Every product has its own unique seasonality. So back when we were selling towels, glassware, whatever, we ended up cutting most of those products because it became too competitive for us to make money. One of the holdovers that we kept somehow is foam kickboards. We're the biggest seller of foam kickboards on Amazon. We sell more foam kickboards than Speedo, PYR, all these companies. And that product has like a very unique seasonality to it. And so like a lot more foam kickboards are sold in March. Then in January, and then it goes to April, it gets up a little bit higher, and it goes to May, and then June. June is like peak kickboard selling season. So what you're doing when you're forecasting products is you're you're saying like, okay, if I'm I sold a hundred in January, and um, usually I sell five times as many in June as I sell in January, and if I sold a hundred in January, I need to make sure I have a five hundred for June. So we're or always ordering inventory well in advance of when we think we need it, according to what our sales are going to be. If the sales in January are 50, then we'll only have 250 kickboards available in June. Um, so that's kind of how that works. And we've trans. So when the market changes, you got to change. And the market on Amazon transitioned from like a time when you could launch like whatever you wanted and make lots of money to to a way com- more competitive landscape. So we focused instead on our core brands, Brain Flakes, Goodminton, our line of plush animals called Tiger uh, Tail Toys. And those are the only areas where we launch products. So we're no longer launching just like random towels or yeah. speaker systems, wallets. We're focused on Brain Flakes, launching new plush animals. And um, in terms of like launching new 
I had items. I'm very lucky. My wife is like super talented. She used to work at Ralph Lauren and she knows how to make clothes. It turns out she also really knows how to design really good plush animals. So she does a lot of that. Plush animals is one of your top sellers. Is there, besides it being like a popular deal, is there like a business reason why it's good to sell plush animals? They're cheap to make and have good margin or they ship easy. Like why, why plush animals? So back uh, in the days of being on Taobao, I got to the clothing category and there was this like tiger backpack that was selling really he- really well in China. And I was like, oh, that's dope. Let's sell that. <laughs> So then I ended up taking a flight to like Hebei province. Just look, I couldn't find the factory anywhere in Hebei province. And I, so I went to this area where they had all the backpacks and I was like, Hey man, like, um, I just was looking for the factory. And eventually this old guy came out of a shop and he was like, well, he's, he didn't say this in English, but he said it in Chinese. And he was like, you're in the wrong province. You have to go to this other city if you want to buy those goods. And he had like really long eyebrows. <laughs> I'll never forget the way he looks. And so I'm lucky for that old dude. Um, and so we ended up buying plush backpacks from a stuffed animal factory in a totally different province. And uh, the plush backpacks did really, really well. Uh, but eventually it petered out. And then I was looking at that factory. And I was like, oh, they got so many stuffed animals. Why don't we start selling those on Amazon? And the stuffed animals did really well. And then we're just like, okay, we got to turn this into a brand. And we got better and better at selling plush animals. And we have a brand. And every one of the plush animals has its own story. And some of the the plush animals even have their own book, which I wish I could show you because they're freaking awesome. Um, And so that's why we sell plush animals on Amazon. Because it wasn't like some sort of like Berkshire halfway Buffett, like, Oh, this is the optimal market. It has the most moats. It was like, okay, this is making money. Yep. How can we widen whatever moats it has? Yep. If that makes sense. And then maybe the, the last question kind of on product, everything seems to uh, be kind of like a toy or something for children or kind of something fun. Is there a reason why you've stuck into that category or that's just kind of where you started and that's where your expertise is or was there any more uh, kind of smart behind it? Yeah, there's there's not that much more smart to it. Yeah. Um, we're So we have like two levels of brands. We've got like the product brands, kind of like Procter & Gamble makes Swiffer Sweeper or like Dove Soap or something like that. But Procter & Gamble is like known as a company that makes like solid household products. We want Via Heart to be a company that's like known for making really good, high quality toys that are sold at reasonable prices. And so, yeah, to your point, like, you know, we have some expertise selling toys, having done it for 11 years. So we just doubled down on that area and that's what we're trying to grow. Okay. We're going to have a whole riff on Amazon in particular. So these questions don't necessarily, you have to answer them through the Amazon lens, but Earlier, you said that, especially in China, people will copy you. People will, even if you have maybe a patent, they don't really care. How do you fight that? Do you find a new supplier? Do you just kind of, it's the cost of doing business and you just kind of underwrite it? Like, how do you fight copying copycats? So, uh, it's the cost of doing business. Yeah. Um, at one point we had a, we had an office over in China and we hired, I hired three employees and it turns out that two out of three of them ended up copying and counterfeiting, uh, brain flakes. And that was like an enormously painful ordeal to go through, like both like psychologically, because like you hired someone, how could they do this to you? Yeah. And then also like from a business perspective, it was like a difficult problem to solve. And I, uh, every attorney I spoke to was like, oh, you can't do anything about that. They're in China and whatever. And I was like, no, fuck that. Like, I know that we can do something here because they're selling on Amazon and there's money. They got money in America um, if they're selling on Amazon because Amazon keeps a balance of the, the last two weeks of your sales kind of in the Amazon like financial system before they, they pay you out. Yeah, And so I ended up suing them. Um, and, uh, I ended up actually like making my money back and paid whatever legal bills it took for me to sue them. That's good because what they did was horrible. Um, and, uh, out of that, I was like, I know that other people have this problem. So I ended up launching a litigation financing company called Edison 
which basically just helps people go after predominantly Chinese uh, copycats. And so there are ways to like to uh, copycats, but you got to know how to do it. It's complicated and you got to make sure that you register your intellectual property, which means you got to have your copyrights, your trademarks or your patents in order if you want to make that happen. But yeah, it's a cost of doing business and it's not always practical to run around suing everybody. Yeah, we, we don't have to go deep into Edison, but essentially if I was selling something and somebody copied me, I'd hire Edison and they would run the process to try and make it right for me. So yeah, what Edison would do is Edison would gather the evidence you needed in order to have a lawyer file the lawsuit and Edison pays all your legal bills. So you don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about paying legal bills if it turns out that you don't recover any money. Yeah. And in, in, so Edison only get, makes money if there's money to be recovered at the end of that lawsuit. Okay. That's how Edison works. Is there anything, uh, with China that, maybe like keeps you up at night that isn't the what's being talked about in the media? Is there anything like that the average kind of somebody thinking about getting into e-commerce is not thinking about? Um, the way our laws are structured, it's actually beneficial to be in China selling in the U.S. market. It's easier to be in China selling to the U.S. market than it is to be in America selling to the U.S. market. Yeah. And that's just like a complete and total failure of our government to allow that to happen. Um, why? I, why? Why is it easier to be in China selling into America? Um, so you you're closer to suppliers. First of all, you can't. For the most part, there are exceptions. For the most part, you're not held accountable for unsafe product you sell. You're not held accountable for the most part for any intellectual property theft or crime you commit. Um, like same goes for like fake reviews and stuff like that. Just, yeah, there's not really a legal mechanism for American small businesses for the most part, to go after Chinese businesses that are engaging in these things. Whereas if you're an American seller selling on Amazon, like you go to prison <laughs> yeah. for committing some of these acts. Um, so there's like a different incentive structure for the Chinese versus the Americans. The Chinese obviously have lower labor rates for hiring and they're closer to their suppliers. And also the Chinese don't pay taxes, which is pretty helpful. They don't, they're not paying American taxes, um, even though they're selling on the American market. Whereas Americans, they need to pay estimated taxes. And there's a great deal of tax burden on them. So there are a whole bunch of different ways as to why it's easier for Chinese sellers to sell in America than it is for American sellers. All right, let's talk about your eight uh, person team. Um, we had a great conversation about maybe what are they all doing and where are they all located? And then we can chat a little bit about just kind of the experience of working with folks from other countries and maybe the way they look at the world being a little different. Yeah. So, um, what we accomplish is attributable to them. Uh, I talked a lot about me, but, uh, what they do is equally important or more important a lot of times and we can't make it happen without them. We've got uh, one guy in Pakistan, two people in Brazil, one guy in India, two people in Austin, Texas, me and my wife. And then our warehouse team is based in uh, Canton, Texas, which is about like an hour east of Dallas. And um, they, you know, everyone comes from a different cultural background. so. We just kind of figure out a way to like run the company internationally and everyone kind of in a way is like forced to adopt the by heart culture instead of, you know, the respective cultures of wherever they came from. So that's pretty much it. We do a lot of work over Zoom and stuff like that and it actually works like really, really well. How do you keep everybody, like, is there a software that you use so that keeps everybody kind of on task and knowing what's going on and obviously different time zones and everything. Like how do you all communicate and stay in sync? Yeah. So, uh, Slack is like running, you know, 16 hours a day. Yeah. And then we use like project management software, like Asana, Jira, Trello to just like keep track of different projects, whether it's the production of brain flakes 
or uh, we're having a lot of difficulty getting our containers over to the United States. And so we want to see if we can set up a relationship directly with Maersk, the shipping line. So we create kind of like a card or a job for that. And then we pair that with like a weekly video meeting where people from, I don't know how many different countries that is, four or five different countries, we all just come together and we talk about the different things that need to get done. And uh, yeah, you, you, you don't need everyone to be in one place anymore. Yeah, it's just great if you can make that happen, but it, it's I think it's much better to to pull from the best and brightest and the people who are most motivated globally to make your your company. Are the folks overseas uh, from just like a personal level, or how do they differ from Americans as far as like appreciation and gratefulness and things of that nature? Um, yeah, they're they're on average they're they're way more grateful for the job opportunities that they have. I mean, uh, not to say that the guys that I work with in the warehouse are super grateful and I owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude because it's really hard to work in the warehouse that doesn't have air conditioning. Yeah. And they're both smart. They're not just like dudes who pack packages. They solve problems. They innovate, come up with better ways to make our products. But on average, for sure, I, I won't lie to you. It's people in India, Pakistan, Brazil, they're much happier to have a job and than it seems like Americans are right now. And, you know, cost is definitely, you can overpay people overseas and make them ecstatic and happy to have a job of that pay much more easily than you can with people in the United States when you're running a tough, sometimes low margin consumer products business. It's, it's hard in, yeah. in America to run these type of businesses until you're really scaled up with a huge rent. All right, let's talk about the the big bad beast, Amazon. Um, you're pretty vocal about it on Twitter, so uh, maybe just the the to start, just kind of when you're putting a product on Amazon, do they have to vet it? Do they have? Is there a process that you have to go through to get approved to sell on Amazon, or is it like listing something on Craigslist? Uh, you can sell pretty quickly without a whole lot of vetting. Yeah. Uh, originally, you could sell anything and there weren't any kind of restrictions, but as time has gone on, there are increasingly restrictions towards selling on Amazon. I'm not sure what it takes in order to set up an account on Amazon today because I haven't done it for many, many years. But uh, depending on what product category you're in, if you're selling jewelry, you might need to provide a test result to show that your gold jewelry is indeed 24 karat gold. If you're selling toys, we have to we pay like a ton of money and spend a ton of time on safety and we pay for testing, to make sure that our products are safe and that they don't have lead and all that stuff. And sometimes we have to submit those documents to Amazon in order to ensure that they can be for sale. Okay. So you've been on there since 2014 when it seemed like it was uh, you know, a, a free for all. And then it just kind of seems like one as an outsider watching the news, but then being on Twitter, seeing, you know, tw uh, Amazon sellers talk, Seems like Amazon's kind of maybe becoming more of, uh, you know, they're getting maybe the words taking advantage. Like, what are the things about Amazon today that you love, and what are the things that you're you you don't like about working with them? So um, we do have today. We kind of so we start out in retail, and then we went e-commerce, and then going back to your question about how to scale up and build brain flakes into a brand, we're like, okay, let's start dipping our foot into retail again. Um, one of our biggest customers for brain flakes just didn't pay us for like a month or two and Amazon pays us on time. So that's one thing that we, we like a lot about Amazon. I mean, Amazon is, is such a huge topic on the one hand, there's like a huge engine for innovation in the United States and they kind of, like I said earlier, right? They enabled me to like live a better life in that I no longer had to bring the packages to the postal service every single day. They made it a lot easier. And so they enabled the growth of my company. And we ended up hiring a lot of people and all that. So that's, that's great. But at the same time, they, you know, they take 50 cents, more than 50 cents of every dollar we sell on there through various fees. And they're just like printing money and they, They've kind of enabled this unfair competition situation we have between American and Chinese sellers. 
and they just like play a lot of games and they just bullshit everything and you know like when it came to sales tax they were like oh we can't charge sales tax because we're not a retailer but then in other ways they they act like a retailer and they require us to, pro- to provide them with all this testing and stuff like that when well, it's supposed to be an open marketplace you can't on one hand say you're a retailer and on the other say you're not so it's just like it's just it's tough that in certain categories amazon is like super dominant and it's just like it drives me crazy that they don't really play by the rules and they seem to get away doing whatever they want to do and at the same time just make boatloads of money well you said they take 50 cents of every dollar i'm i'm making a general assumption maybe in 2014 they were taking 10 cents of every dollar is there something that worries you that you know two years from now they'll be taking 60 cents of every dollar or is it kind of capped yeah you're absolutely right um we we once did this this analysis i think in 2014 they were taking like 33 cents of every dollar and now it's over 50 cents um and so how so one of the ways they did that is they added um basically the amazon equivalent of adwords to search. Mm-hmm. So in some categories, your top seven results are just ads. So if you want your products to appear on Amazon, you have to have, um, you have to pay Amazon advertising. And that's kind of one of the ways they went from 33 cents all, all the way to like 52 cents for us. American sellers, I always say, are like between a rock and a hard place. And the rock is Amazon. And the hard place is unfair Chinese competition. And you just are kind of like sandwiched between those two things and your margins get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed by like these guys who come in with like lower pricing who don't necessarily have to compete fairly. And this huge monopolistic corporation that's always trying to figure out a way to make more and more money. So that is something that I am concerned about. Um, In 2020, that wasn't an issue because so much demand ended up shifting away from retail towards e-commerce. That everyone in e-commerce did really well. But now in 2021, we're like just back to that pattern of just like margins getting squeezed more and more and more. But I'm not like I wouldn't say I'm complaining about that. And we we absolutely have like a strategy to combat it, and that's namely like you know excellent quality products with like solid branding and shifting as much revenue as we can off Amazon via our websites and stuff like that. But yeah, that's, that's for sure. What's happening. It's difficult. Do you worry about them copying your products? I know that for some people, they complain that they're caught, that Amazon literally takes over their products and sells them for cheaper. I think like all birds, they created like an all birds overnight and sold it for half as much. Yeah, my buddy DM'd me. He was like, look at this. And he sent me like five products that he was selling that Amazon Basics had launched. And what he was complaining about was that if he was paying Amazon money to send customers to his listing on Amazon. And then below his product, it was like an Amazon Basics ad for their copy. I don't worry about it, though, for two reasons. The first reason is I think we're actually like really good at what we do. The quality of all of our products can be better. We'll make them better. But like Amazon isn't actually good at manufacturing and they're not even good at like keeping those items in stock. So it's like, ah, like, yeah, sure. Launch an Amazon basics versions of brain flakes. Like we'll, we'll mess you up. Like I, I'm not worried about Amazon when it comes to that. And then the second reason is I'd love to blast them on Twitter if that happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had you had tweeted something. I I think it was earlier in the year. I might be botching a little bit, but didn't they suspend you or like shut you down for a day or something like that? Or they they did something that you felt was unjust. What did they do? Yeah, and, so, and what did you do? So, uh, well, they suspended our ability to like email customers and never told us why. But um, what they did is they told us that we manipulated reviews and ratings. And then said that our account was at risk of, su- of suspension for doing that. And that's like a huge problem when you have like, you know, seven, eight employees and 90% of your revenue comes from Amazon. And they just like send you an email and be like, hey, by the way, we're going to suspend you at any minute and turn off 90% of your revenue. And the reason why it was like, I felt unfair. It's not even like the reason why I felt it was unfair. It was unfair because we didn't do that. And then two, they wouldn't tell us how they determined that we did that. And then three, when we asked them, they were just like obnoxious. And so what I did is I, I called Amazon and I was like, hey, is this a recorded line? And they're like, yes. And I was like, it's a recorded line too. 
And so I video, I recorded a video of me calling Amazon customer service, trying to understand why they were threatening to suspend us. And it was just like, it was really embarrassing for them. They like couldn't even tell us. And it's like, how do you treat companies on your platform that are literally paying you millions and millions of dollars every year because we're paying Amazon? Like last year, we paid them about $3 million. Like, how are you not telling me the reason for why you say that we're about to be suspended? It's, it's just, it's bad business. It's unfair. It's stupid. Can you speak at all to um, your episode with Congress and speaking before Congress and what preempted that and what, what it was all about? Yeah, sure. So I don't think they're, I don't, I, I can't believe I got invited. So no one who's an Amazon seller likes talking about Amazon kind of like two reasons for that. First reason is typically Amazon sellers, their revenue is like highly concentrated with Amazon. Ours is 90%. So you don't, it's like, it's like taking your best customer and being like, yeah, I'm going to go talk shit about my best customer. Not the best idea in the world. Yeah. The other reason why people don't like talking publicly about Amazon is that when you sell on Amazon, there's like a clause in the contract that says like something to the effect of like speaking to the press, speaking publicly about our relationship is like grounds for suspension. So <laughs> uh, people don't like talking about Amazon publicly. Some guy got invited to Congress and then he was like, fuck, I can't do this. I'm going to get in trouble. And so then I think I forget how it happened, but he like knew me and he was like, oh, this guy will do it. So they basically just subbed me in at the last minute and I got to speak before Congress, which was like really awesome. Uh, it was like a great honor. And I was a little bit naive about the experience, but like afterwards, um, I, I like learned a lot and it was just really cool. Yeah. Is there uh is there other competitors like Shopify or it, can you, can, it, is there anything out there that gives you hope that Amazon isn't going to be kind of the, the big bad monster forever? Is there other platforms for you to sell on or, or things that are interest you or is it all Amazon right now? Uh, so we used to be 98% revenue by Amazon. And now we're last year, we were like 93%. And I think we're whittling that down. Um, we're increasingly shifting our revenue towards wholesale. So we're selling our plush animals at the San Diego Zoo, which is really awesome. And they've been That's buying awesome. huge amounts of reptiles from us, which is cool. <laughs> um, we, we opened brainflakes.com, which is the Shopify website. And, uh, you know, you can buy you digital instructions for brain flakes there. And it's pretty cool. But we, we just got to figure out how to scale these things up because, you know, yeah. we did $7 million on Amazon last year. We're going to do more than that this year. And we just got to figure out a way to divert revenue away from that platform. But it is so hard because uh, most people, when they buy toys, they, the Amazon's the place they go. Is didn't Walmart they bought Jet? Do they not provide a, an opportunity for sellers like you to sell off kind of the Walmart platform? We sell on Walmart. Um, it's like one to two percent of our Amazon sales. Yeah, and that's just because <laughs> so, customers aren't arriving at Walmart to buy toys. Yeah, there just aren't as many customers. I mean, if you wanted to like defeat Amazon, the way to do it would be like through grocery. I think yeah. so. Like Walmart is like pretty capable at grocery. If they can do Walmart, if they can do Walmart grocery delivery, and then combine that with like durable products like toys and other things, then maybe they stand a chance to um, pose a competitive threat to Amazon. But it's so hard because Walmart is only now just opening their own fulfillment centers to store goods, and Amazon has like networks of like multiple hundreds of these things already. And then even if Walmart were able to like match Amazon in terms of the number of warehouses they have. So they have fulfillment by Walmart everywhere. Then they don't have Prime. And then they also don't even, they don't have their own delivery service, which Amazon has. So the only, yeah. so this this uh, Tobias Lutke Shopify guy is like really good and maybe he'll figure something out. But like Amazon is a beast. It's like maybe the greatest yeah. company that's ever been created. <laughs> Like in terms of its like competitive energy and what it's accomplished, so it's really hard for someone else to just come in and push them aside. Yep. When when things uh, on Amazon, there's certain products you can order in the morning, and by the afternoon they're at your house. If I were to buy mm -hmm. something from you, w w are any of your products available to be delivered same day? And if so, like how does that happen? It's just really, if I was living in New York and bought something in the same day, you would have to have 
certain product in a warehouse close by my house at a, and they'd have to buy it at a certain time. How do these same days deliveries happen? Yeah, Chris, you, you, you nailed it. So the way that like Amazon makes same day, two day delivery happen is not by flying things around the country all the time. That would be too expensive. So yeah. the way Amazon does it is by storing inventory close to major population centers. So um, when we send our goods into Amazon, we send in like truckloads to a single location. And then Amazon distributes 10% of the goods to Seattle, 20% of the brain flakes to New York, 30% to Texas. They keep 30% in Texas. And so that's how they do it. For us, in order to offer that, we would have to just fly everything from our Texas warehouse. Yeah, You're yeah. in Fort Worth, so you would get it next day. But if you were in New yeah. York, the only way that you could get it same day or next day would be if we paid like more than probably what you paid to buy the product to ship it by air. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, I asked you uh, on our pre-call, I just said, what are you going to do with this business long term? You kind of already gave one answer. You want to be the second largest. Um, you want Brainflakes to be second to Lego, um, but you, well, I'll start there. What, what do you want to do with the business? Is there, do you even have a strategy or just keep growing? And then I want to talk to you about your Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger analogy. Sure. So, um, want to scale this business, want to learn about how to scale a business better, want my employees to like buy in and own and profit from this business as this business grows. That's important to me too. And um, yeah, and achieve that goal that you said earlier, Brain Flakes, let's make that the second biggest building toy brand in the world. We're going to sell that product in China and we're going to sell that product in India. And we think we can make that happen. And uh, what's cool about that is our products aren't just like, oh, they're not novelties or something that just like makes money. They're like, you know, they educate kids. Yeah. They make them smarter. And with Brain Flakes, it, it feels like a noble goal to kind of grow the brand because you're kind of encouraging and teaching kids to improve their spatial thinking. So, so I, you know, if I'm like 70 years old or 80 years old, I can look back on that and be like, ah, I didn't just make a boatload of money and then like open up a building at some university. Like, ah, oh, yeah, we actually did yep. something really good for the world. And do you think about your company more as kind of the platform that you're building to be able to quickly launch great products, get them in the hands of customers that can learn, and it's more the the platform that's the the value, or is it does the value lie in these specific products, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it's absolutely both. Um, you know, we don't have the competitive advantages of a Amazon or. Coca-Cola or anything like that, but we have some competitive advantages and we've got like nascent brand recognition in some of our products and we've scaled some things up. We have got some good comp competitive advantages, but yeah, you're totally right. Like Fireheart is a platform for whatever, it el whatever else we want to do. So we're, we're building yep. uh, our, our warehouse and what's cool is like all the civil engineering, all the architecture, all the structural engineering, every, all the expenses that, kind of become part of the purchase price when a developer sells something to, yep. to a buyer in real estate, all those things are getting expensed. And so there's like favorable tax treatment and that kind of happens because Viheart is a profitable company. And so it's like a, it's a, it's a platform for new ventures. Um, so whatever it is I want to do, whatever it is we want to do as a company, if we want to launch rockets or whatever, like, <laughs> we can launch rockets and pay less taxes as a result of applying the cost of a rocket launch to uh, the profit we make from selling educational toys. Yep. All right. Last question on what to do with the business. You said, I want to make brain flakes into something that Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger would buy. Why yeah. would, what would make them want to buy it? So um, the way I think about like business is like, I have a framework like I just have like a list of competitive advantages and I just like go through those competitive advantages in my head. If I'm like trying to figure out if something is a good business or a bad business. Okay. So one of those competitive advantages is like location, which is like huge, um, obviously in real estate. Um, there's an element of that to like a normal business. If you own the, the Macy's 
in what is it, 34th Street, Herald Square in New York City before e-commerce. Like you have a piece of real estate for your retail business in like the prime location in one of the best buying cities in the entire world. Other business advantages are scale, network effects, which is like the more users you have on your platform, the more valuable your platform is. Data effects, which is like weird stuff that like what Google has. And so Brainflakes, it's got some scale because we order by the container load, which means that our shipping prices from Asia to the United States are as low as possible. One day we'd really like to be able to vertically integrate um, our manufacturing kind of the way that Lego does. And uh, one of the cool things about building toys is that it's like as a buyer, you want to make sure that the, that if you if you have a bunch of Legos at home, if you're buying an off Lego brand building toy, you want to make sure that those products interconnect. So that unto itself with Brain Flakes, if you're like the leading name brand of interlocking plastic discs, you kind of have that competitive advantage. There's that, that like customer fear of them not connecting together. There are technological advantages. There's distribution. Do you have the best distribution network for your products? Is it in Walmart, Costco, Amazon, international, all that stuff? So basically what we're just trying to do is we're going to stack competitive advantages on that product. So, you know, it, it basically has like tons of moats such that like Charlie Munger would, or Warren Buffett would be like, oh, yeah, I'll buy that. They that's, love moats. that's one of the goals. All right. Um, before we get into some Twitter questions, um, I'm going to pretend that you're the, the rich guy that you went and asked about how to start. Uh, I'm, I, I want to, you know, hang up my real estate, uh, career and I want to get into e-commerce. What are like the three or four things that come to mind? Obviously go to China. I got to spend time over there, but from the mistakes that you've made and the things that you've learned, what would you tell somebody, um, you know, as some, some key principles to starting an e-commerce business? So today it's totally different from how it was in 2014, right? Yep. The, the days of being able to just launch a product and make money on Amazon are totally over. Yep. Um, in e- hopefully all this stuff applies to e-commerce as much as, as, much as it does to other things. You got to have a differentiated product. If your product looks the same as somebody else's, then you're only going to be competing on price. That's one. Two, you have to understand how your product is made. If you don't understand how your product is made, you're not going to have good quality. You're not going to have a good cost and you're not going to know how it gets to customers fast, which is also important. So you got to kind of understand how the whole sausage is made. Um, you got to probably this day and age, you got to have some intellectual property tied to it. So not only do you have to have a differentiated product, but your product has to have, you gotta have like a, at least you got to attempt to build a brand. You got to have some copyrights. Maybe if it's like a new tool of of some kind, you could have a utility patent. And then you, you got to move really, really fast without spending too much money. So try some stuff and then double down on what works. You know, don't, don't, don't fall off your Yoshi. If that makes any sense, probably not. But like, don't, when you get fall off your horse, you got to get back on your horse. Don't like cry about it. That's, yeah, yeah. that's how you make money. On the how the, on the how the on the how the sausage is being made, how would it, how would somebody with it doesn't have experience building products actually even know that it was being made the right way? Like, is that just sitting in the factory and and learning? Like, how would I know if I were to see Brain Flakes right now? You could probably show me a terrible way to build it, and I would probably it, since I have no reference, I'd be like, okay, that's pretty good. You would look at it and be like, that's terrible. How does a beginner even know that something's being made right? Man, that's like, it reminds me of that book, like Zen and the motorcycle maintenance or whatever, where the guy is just like, what is quality? Yeah. That's like one of life's like most fundamental questions. What is quality? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, like a quality product is a product that people understand. It sells. It's got to sell. If it doesn't sell, it's not quality. Maybe your packaging is wrong. Maybe your value proposition is wrong. But I think basically you're right. You you gotta you gotta get your hands on samples. You gotta like try them out right. yourself, and then you gotta get to the factory and you gotta try stuff. 
and then find people who maybe know more than you and see if you can pick their brain. And then it's just like a totally yeah. iterative process. There is no like handbook for how to make a good new product. Like there is for like launching a product on Amazon. Like that launching a product on Amazon is like have good pictures, get good reviews by having a good product, pay for some advertising. Don't be stupid about how you pay for advertising. And uh, you maybe have a video or something like that. Don't run out of stock. But how to make a good new product, that's like really hard. Uh, yeah, just try stuff. <laughs> I that's a whole episode. Yeah. All right, let's do some uh, some Twitter questions, and then we'll we'll bring it home. You've been generous. Um, all these ships are sitting idle in the ocean. We see these pictures of all these ships that have product on them, and they're just sitting there, not coming into port. Do you know why? Uh, I think I know why. I think the reason why is because China's ports run 24 hours a day. The Asian ports, yeah. Singapore, those are all running 24 hours a day. Our ports on the West Coast are run by unions and they run 16 hours a day. So if you have this country that's like has this amazing supply chain, is able to bang out container after container, excuse me, ship after ship of containers worth of consumer products, you got to be able to unload those products. And if you, on one side of the Pacific ocean, you got people like a port that's running 24 hours a day on the other side of the ocean, you've got a port that's running 16 hours a day. You're going to get like a backlog of ships. And that's why we just have all these ships in Los Angeles and that, which is America's major port. And that's why I think Biden should just be like, Hey, run this 24 hours or I will bring in the military to do it. And it's just, it's bizarre to me. I don't understand why that problem doesn't get fixed. Maybe it's because they don't understand what the problem is. I don't get it. Yep. And is it a, is it a COVID related thing and, and like a lack of labor also, or is there always kind of a backup? It's just, there's nobody ever posting pictures of it. Uh, no, there, there never is this much backlog of ships. There, the only other time that there's been a backlog of ships like this, to my knowledge, is when there was a strike at those ports and the guys just decided not to work. I don't know enough about the, how those ports operate to be like, oh yeah, there's zero COVID problems. Maybe they had two guys in a cramped like crane room moving the, the levers back and forth and now they can only have one. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think that what's happening is that yeah. for the first, not for the first time in American history, but we, we gave a significant amount of money to American consumers in 2020. Like in the great financial crisis, we mostly gave money to we, we, we bought treasuries, but this time we gave a significant amount of money to American consumers. And when American consumers get their hands on money, they tend to spend it. And they, yep. so they spent it on, on goods in part because they were at home and under lockdown. And yep. that has kind of continued. And so American consumers bought more goods uh, than they ever had before. And the ports and ships have fixed capacities. And so when you buy more than you would ever have before that create you have like a ton of demand but supply stays fixed and so like yeah. you know from, from real estate what happens like prices go up and yeah. in our case prices went up and also things are a lot slower than usual so that's what's happening from your perspective uh was china ever as locked down as america was uh were they following our same playbook or were they a lot more uh you know business as usual while we've experienced maybe a different reality over here in the states way more lockdown in, um, in china in or in america ways. in china way more lockdown so there are like legit videos of people being welded into their apartment buildings in wuhan yeah so local government just took like some steel slabs and they just welded the door shut so people couldn't leave so the virus couldn't spread also in china whenever they in vietnam right now like all the factories are shut down. It's kind of like a similar situation. The factory workers are, are sleeping in tents in the factories, just waiting for these COVID lockdowns then, which has been disrupted. Uh, another thing is like wow. when there are four cases in China, China will just be like, everyone is being tested. And they'll just have like a city of 3 million, all get tested. And it's just like, it's a different political system and they're just able to do things differently. Um, so China is for sure way more locked down than the United States except in the fact that they ended up having a much less severe COVID problem after the original outbreak. So things in China ended up like letting up 
when we were having our, our tougher lockdowns. But our toughest lockdown was never as bad as China's toughest lockdown. Got it. All right. From our favorite Twitter friend, Girdley. You are comfortable being combative on Twitter when the default strategy seems to be sweetness amongst most accounts. Why? I think maybe a better question, and maybe you, I could be competitive with you, Chris. Um, <laughs> a better question is like, why is everyone so sweet? So yeah. like everyone is sweet because they, they want to make connections on Twitter or they, you know, they want to attract, uh, they want to sell more brain flakes or, or whatever. Yeah. And I think like by nature, I'm like kind of a debate oriented competitive person. And I just like find it fun. And yeah. then also like, I'm not just on Twitter to help people and, do stuff like that. Yeah, that's it's great if I'm creating value for the people who follow me. But also, like, I'm there to kind of like build a persona, both personally and for our company. And yeah. people like a fight. It's like interesting. So like, yeah. I sometimes I'll just like start fights with people on Twitter, because I, I kind of find it interesting and fun, especially yeah. if I think they're wrong. So and then also just in general, I, I I, I'm okay, more okay with than the average person is at like being different and weird. So like I don't yeah. I don't care that much if people think that I'm weird. So I'm weird on Twitter. I love it. Uh I like it. All right, you have a belief that advice is bullshit unless it's from someone who's already been there or done that. Is that always true? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think that I the best that. advice comes from people who have a lot of experience in a domain where the people who make mistakes leave the domain. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, now I feel like I'm being bad here. But just like, so if you, all right, I won't get into that. But there are certain people yeah. in the government who can make the wrong decision repeatedly and they never get fired and they're never held up for re-election or anything like that. But in the world of business, if you make a mistake, you go bankrupt. So if someone has been in business for 30 plus years, 40 plus years in an area and they say, hey, don't do it this way, do it this way, do it that way, then they're probably right. I think Going back to your original uh, question, maybe the exception would be like if you're asking someone who's 70 about like new technology as it applies to their business, they may not know so much about that. But in general, yeah. if you get advice from old people who've been through stuff and that stuff is such that people don't know what they're doing, leave the sample, the sample of people who give advice, then yeah, you can probably trust it. Yep. I'm with you. I've never, never worked for anybody. Um, I've always had a natural comfort in just asking people, uh, the dumb question and it's saved me years and years of pain probably. And like you have not always followed the advice and learned down the road what they meant. You sometimes just have to wait till you get punched in the face, but I'm with you. All right. Uh, a DJ macro said if he can't buy his products in China, where would he shift production? Totally depends on what you're making. Yep. If you want to make jewelry, India might be suitable. If you want to make wood furniture, Thailand. If you want to make rubber, go to Malaysia. If you want to make U.S. dollars, go to the United States. Um, oil, you know, oil is made in America because we have it here and we've got the supply chain. So if you don't want to make your products in China, you've got to make your products in a place that has... Like what makes a good country for that? They have to have supply chain. So that means that the, like the components that go into your product need to be available there. They have to have good roads, good ports. They have to, ideally they need to have the raw materials close by. Like Malaysia has like killer rubber, rubber plantations. So a ton of rubber products are made in Malaysia. Um, so it depends on what you want to make. Yep. All right. Uh, Bobby Eubanks said, warehouses, can we ever get to a point where automated toy production is uh, a possibility in the United States? Yeah. So if you're making something over and over and over again, and it's big, um, so the reason why it being big is important is that if it's small, then it can move from Asia to the United States very cheaply. 
it's big, yeah. like a garbage bin. That's not necessarily the case. So actually, if you go to a store and you see like pool noodles, which are big garbage bins, large plastic products are actually oftentimes made in the United States. If you're making one thing repeatedly and not changing it a lot, then you don't really need human involvement in, in it so much. And so you can just like automate that process. If you can automate the process and you can secure the raw materials, so let's say like plastics in America, then for sure you can make things in America. But generally, I don't think that we're going to, I think that manufacturing in this country is just going to keep on getting smaller and smaller as part of a, uh, our overall economy until like one of two things happen. One, we have to like put tariffs on goods if we want to restart manufacturing. And then the other thing is that uh, we, we would need like the dollar to be less powerful. The, the dollar yep. takes us very far overseas. All right. Uh, Neil Quinn asked, how much better are Amazon conversion rates compared to other channels between more eyeballs plus high conversion seems very hard to sell elsewhere? Yeah, um, I, it's been a while since I looked at this, but to my memory, like the conversion rate for brain flakes on Amazon is like 30 to 40 percent. The conversion rate yeah. on our website is like uh, right now we're improving it. But it's like between one and two percent. So it's about 30 times. Yep. higher and also there are way more customers seeing our product on amazon than there are on our website so it's it's hard it's really hard to make it to make that work all right man that's all i've got for today this has been awesome how can people find you maybe on twitter and then how can they find your business yeah so um you can follow me on twitter uh, my handle is molson m-o-l-s-o-n underscore heart h-a-r-t and uh business you can uh search for brain flakes it's like brand flakes but the word brain or via heart v-i-a-h-a-r-t and you can check out our products and see uh if if i know what i'm talking about when it comes to manufacturing and stuff like that.